Well, good morning and welcome to today's live video here at Concordia Technology Solutions. My name is Peter Frank and I've been the host of this video for weeks on end now. So thanks for tuning in again. We've got another great topic today. Uh, today we are talking about purchasing audio and visual equipment for um, your church. So um, we've got a special guest today who wrote an ebook for us on this topic that goes through the whole process. And I'm excited to have him join in and give a, a preview of the ebook. We're not going to cover all the details because there's so much there. We'd be here for quite a while. But um, this process that John goes through, and I'll introduce John in a second, is just fantastic. And it really could be applied outside of just AV equipment. Now that's, of course, the topic for today, and we're going to dig into that in more detail. But I encourage you, even if you're not in the process of buying AV equipment, to take a look at this ebook because that's, it's just a, a really well thought out process that's based on a lot of experience. So let me introduce John to you. John Elmer is the Manager of Media Services for Concordia uh, Theological Seminary. I always have to pause as I say that. We have the same acronym, and I think we stole it from you guys, so I apologize about that, John. But thanks for uh, joining us here. Um, John's based in Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, where you've served at the seminary for 10 years. Is that right? That's correct. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for writing this ebook. We've got uh, oh, an ex excerpt of it on our blog that uh, our viewers can take a look at. But, John, um, to get us started, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your role there at the seminary, and kind of how you got into this, um, this role of AV equipment and where you've got all your knowledge, because I know you have a lot of experience in that. So just kind of get us started by telling us about yourself. Well, that's a loaded question. Uh, I've actually been doing uh, media for 20 years. I have been at the seminary for 10 years. My role here is media content and services manager, which is a really big, long title that doesn't quite fit on my business card. <laughs> uh, but it basically means that I deal with anything that has to do with audio, video, lighting, uh, and that covers a lot of ground. So I uh, one of the one of the most visible things I do, I deal with the daily chapel broadcast. We broadcast our chapels live every day on Facebook as well as on live stream, uh, the platform we're on here. Yeah. Um, and uh, then that branches into our events such as uh, the symposias, uh, Good Shepherd Institute, our various uh, lecture series that we do. Uh, so I'm doing uh uh, event-based support there, so sound, lighting, and uh, and any AV for the live event, but then a lot of times I'll also broadcast those, so I'm covering that as well. Uh, and then it also goes uh, into the classroom where I, where I support our basic classroom technologies, projection, uh, media in the classroom. Uh, we're hoping to, to uh, move into lecture capture and that sort of thing, so it's just a lot of different things. I wear a lot of different hats, and uh, it's actually one of the reasons I've been here so long because uh, I do have such a great variety and it's really rewarding to, you never get bored. You, right. uh, you, you do one thing for a few days and then a couple of days later uh, there's an event or something and you're doing something completely different. Well, uh, as far as uh, how I uh, got into AV, well, it's really just the hard way. Um, I started in broadcast and uh, I've, I've been in, in worked for the ABC affiliate in Jackson. I worked in commercial production. I supervised the television studio. And so you just kind of learn everything the hard way as you go <laughs> along. Well, that's, uh, that's excellent that you have that kind of background to bring to the seminary because I know at any of the seminaries, they're not huge schools. You can't have a huge staff. And so you do have to wear multiple hats and, and you know, have multiple roles to support all the activities that go on there. So that's great. And I know, um, as we were talking before, the, the one side of this that you're not usually used to is being on this side of the camera. So thanks for uh, joining us, being willing to get in front of the camera today to talk about this. So... Um, this the ebook that you wrote for us really goes through three different phases and we're going to go through those um, one by one and get into a little bit more detail but the first stage that you write about is planning so um you talk about the first step in that planning is conducting a needs analysis can you explain what that is and how um, a church or church workers would go about starting that process yeah, absolutely. And uh, I am going to start out kind of my caveat for the, this whole uh, podcast here is uh, 
that I, I tried to be very clear and everything's in these nice, neat sections in the ebook. Um, and, and, it, and it works great that way. And of course, in real life, it's usually a lot messier. So uh, phase one sometimes looks like phase one and, and phase one and a half. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, uh, for the needs analysis, this is actually, um, it sounds fancy, it's pretty simple. But uh, it's just a, a basic fact that, that you can't really go about any sort of purchase, uh, vehicle purchase, uh, 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 any sort of major purchase at the store until you actually know what you need. And so it's really important to start there and actually take time in this process. And the more details you can put into this part of the process, the easier it's going to be uh, moving forward into the sales process. Um, and so you just want to stop and first of all, identify uh, your big problem um, and, and then to begin to add details to that. Uh, and so I think I, for the purposes of the ebook, uh, I, I actually used uh, a current example from my own church that we're currently dealing with, and that's our lighting system. And I think maybe it might be easier uh, uh, for the purposes of the podcast here to actually continue to use that uh, that illustration. So in terms of needs analysis there, um, it would be easy to say, uh, you know, to call up a salesperson and, and say, Hey, our lighting system's broken. <laughs> and, and that would, you know, that does, that's not much it's like going to the mechanic and saying, Hey, my car is broken. Uh, so <laughs> what does that actually mean? Well, our needs analysis is first and foremost, our lighting board died. So, uh, that's a pretty big need right there. We can't control the lighting system without the light board functioning. So that's a pretty immediate need. Uh, but we also know when really looking into this that, that some of our demers are starting to go bad. And we've researched it and we can't replace them new. The company no longer sells the equipment. And we found some used stuff on eBay, but we've got kind of in the back of our heads that at some point this is gonna become an emergency. and so. Looking the, at this on a large scale project, it would be easy to just say right now, hey, we need a new light board and, and be done with it. But then we could have a major emergency a year from now and not, you know, planned accordingly. So just to kind of cut this part short, uh, it's important to go through the whole problem and to say we have this need. Uh, in our case, you know, the dimmers are starting to go bad. We should probably look at what we're going to do about that. Our fixtures are getting old. Should we begin looking at replacing those? So all of these things go into a needs analysis that we can then provide to a consultant uh, to, to begin to help us know what do we need to purchase? How do we begin to fix this? Well, and that's a good branching off point to the next subject in that phase one is working with a consultant. Um, can you explain what that would look like? Because it's not like um, you can just go up and then well, and maybe you could just Google, um, you know, consultants for AV equipment for churches, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, explain what you mean by finding a consultant and, and a, how that process works. Uh, well, and here's kind of what I referred to with the phase one and a half. Um, yeah. This is where it kind of gets messy because I did very specifically um, lay out the three roles of consultant, sales representative, and installer in the ebook and uh the fact is a lot of times those three are the same person um it, it certainly is for our situation because i typically serve as a consultant uh i do contact a sales rep but i handle all of the purchasing and then i would also do the install most churches most pastors aren't going to to have a person that is going to be able to do that uh and uh you can actually go on Google and look for uh, <laughs> consultants and they do crop up. And I think I actually gave a tip on that in the ebook. I can't quite remember. Uh, and I did provide a link, I believe, for a resource that I found where you could actually search all sorts of AV vendors in different topical categories like lighting, audio, video, and that sort of thing. So there are some resources in the ebook uh, for, for beginning to find some of those uh, uh, resources. Uh, a lot of times you'll have somebody locally. In fact, a lot of congregations might have somebody that can kind of serve in the consultant role. And um, it's important to uh, 
it's important to remember that just because you use somebody to consult, they don't have to be your salesperson. They also don't have to be your installer. Um, you, you can just hire a consultant. You can just have a person in your congregation with some expertise that's able to give some insight into the problem. Because all we're really trying to do at this point with the needs analysis and the consultation is to come up with a solution for the problem. We're not looking for a, a price list at this point. What we need to know is where are we going? How are we going to fix this problem? Good. And you mentioned that it's really important to pay that consultant for the work of consulting. And I thought that was an interesting point, especially because many churches uh, have limited budgets and that may seem like an extra expense. But can you explain why that's so important during this process to pay the consultant? Absolutely. Uh, and this is just kind of a personal experience thing um, because I've been on both ends of it. I've been the consultant and I've you know, I've, we've, I've hired consultants and uh, a lot of times, like I like I mentioned before, the consultant might be somebody from your congregation. And so uh, they've already got this internal pressure um, that they feel like they should do this for free. Uh, and But then they also want to uh, serve professionally in this role. And so it, it creates this kind of tension uh, where they're neither one of your congregants nor are they a uh, you know business professional that you're bringing in for professional services. And so simply by paying them, it sets that role. Uh, it's also gonna give you some, some internal value that, hey, we've actually paid for this, this resource. And so I should listen to what this individual is saying. And if, if you're not confident enough in your congregant to actually pay them, then maybe they shouldn't be your consultant. Maybe you should get on the web. Um, and before we get too much farther, uh, a lot of times, uh, even though I, I differentiate the three roles in the ebook, your salesperson is probably going to be your consultant. So if you contact a sales company, uh, preferably re at least regional, if you don't have one in your city, uh, you want somebody that can come out. They're going to look at your situation. They're going to make a cons consultation. They're also going to give you a, a, a list of things to buy from them. So it's also important, and the reason I differentiate the two roles, uh, it's important to remember that if they are your sales rep, um, they've got some money riding on this, and they want you to buy their product. And so just be aware of kind of that relationship that this person that's telling me how to fix my problem also would really love to sell me some gear in order to fix this problem. And, you know, so be a little wary. It doesn't mean we don't trust them, but sure. just be aware of that. Yeah, and I think by paying them, you differentiate that. So at least if you're not continuing on with them on the sales, you've exchanged that value. They've provided the consultation. The church has paid them. So as we, move, as we move into the sales process, let's talk about that, um, that idea of getting quotes. How many quotes should a church get, and um, how can you tell if it's a good quote or a, a bad quote? Um, there's a lot of different things here. Um, I, obviously, the more quotes you get, uh, the better. Uh, looking at the government bid process, the government requires, uh, and I've worked in that, that aspect of getting government bids, um, it, it requires at least three. Uh, and that kind of allows you to uh, compare things. Uh, to balance that, uh, I, I'm never gonna give an absolute answer, you know, because there's so many <laughs> right. ways to do it. Uh, to balance that, the more bids you get, or the more quotes you get, the more confusing things get. Uh, because different vendors are going to uh, quote different equipment. Um, I think I gave the example in the ebook. Uh, vendor A may be a uh, sure, microphone uh, preferred vendor. So he gets preferred pricing on Sure microphones. Vendor B is a Sennheiser uh, microphone and he get a uh, seller and he gets preferred pricing on those. So you're gonna get two different looking quotes with completely different microphones. And some, sometimes it can get a little confusing, especially when you get three, four, five, to say, well, which one is the correct set of equipment that I should get? So um, I would always at least get two opinions, three is a great number as well. And sometimes that's kind of difficult. Sometimes we're struggling just to find one vendor uh, to get a quote, much less two or even three. 
And so uh, another way to kind of check up uh, on your vendor, um, two other ways. Number one is if you had a separate consultant, you can always show them the quote, say, hey, um, from your experience, does this look fair? Am I getting fair pricing? Is this good equipment they're, that they're quoting me? Now, back to our situation where our consultant is also our salesperson, uh, you can actually do a little homework yourself. And I provided some links in the ebook to some sites. Uh, I don't work for those companies. They're not paying me in any way. They have no idea who I am. Uh, <laughs> I've just provided some links to some ma major equipment uh, resellers that are online that you can actually type in model numbers for the equipment that you're being quoted on and check their pricing and see if it's comparable. And I, I would say, you know, because of the preferred pricing model, uh, you know, as long as you're within uh, five to 10 percent on the price, you're probably getting a fair price. Uh, and, you know, you're going to run into places where the online price is higher and uh, other places where the on price online price is lower. Uh, but that's a great way to just double check your your vendor and make sure they're giving you fair pricing. Yeah, I think that's good to know that um, there are preferred pricing. So if you see different prices on the same equipment, you know that one person isn't just marking it up that much more, that they might be getting a different cost because of their relationship with the vendor. So that's good insight. Uh, I know this is kind of an unfair question, but as we get into this topic of costs, as a church is beginning to prepare budgeting for AV equipment, um, what is a, a good range? You know, what's the absolute minimum that you're going to have to pay? And I'm talking like going through a, a full system, not just patching something or fixing individual pieces. Um, but do you have a, an estimated range or a way of figuring out a good range of what a church should expect a budget, knowing that this is going to be something that serves them for several years at a minimum? Uh, I don't. Uh, because different systems, uh, different systems have different price ranges, uh, and you know just the 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 size of the system you're looking at will make just huge huge difference in in the pricing ranges. Um, the good news there and is that uh, prices have come down a lot. Uh, things that uh, cameras that I used to you know, get quoted out at $75,000, I can get for $5,000 now. So the technology's come so far and uh, the pricing's coming down. Uh, and so I'm finding that larger systems are, are beginning to, to get less and less expensive. It's not really helpful for the range that you're looking for. Um, but, right. uh, and I may sneak ahead on you on the question. Um, <laughs> That's okay. But, I kind of have a method that I that I use uh, when I have no idea what range I'm I'm even looking at. Uh, the first one is do it yourself and get on one of these uh, sites. If if you know what equipment you need, if your consultant's been that specific, you might be able to research a bit and at least begin to get a a thousand dollar range for for whatever whatever it is you're looking for. But when working with a sales representative. Um, I like to just throw it at them and see what they'll come back with. And and here, I'm very specific in the ebook. This isn't a wheeling and dealing process. We're not going to the car lot and <laughs> trying to, to get the absolute lowest price. Um, we're in kind of a cooperative effort with the vendor. We're being wise to know that he's trying to sell me something and he's motivated. So, you know, I want to I want to have my, my radar up and, and understand his motivations in the process. But at the same time, a good sales rep is going to understand your limitations as, as a, a church in terms of budget. And they're going to do their best to provide a good quality product uh, at, at a price that's going to fit somewhere in what, what you can handle budget wise. But I like to throw it at them and just say, hey, look, I have no idea where I'm even starting here. Uh, here's my needs analysis, and I believe in the ebook. I even recommended uh, having the consultant uh, when they give their kind of uh, recommendation for what you need that you get it written out, uh, full details, everything that's needed, and then you can provide your needs analysis. If if this is a separate person from your consultant, you can provide uh, your needs analysis and the written consultation to the salesperson and say, here here's what I've been told. Uh, I need to fix my issue. I'd be interested in a second opinion from you. 
Uh, but if you can take that and put together a quote, I'm not looking for every little nickel and dime item at this point, but I would like to know within a range of $1,000 or if it's a big system, maybe a range of $5,000, um, you know, where I'm going to be on the final quote. And then we can really drill into this and start getting every little nickel and dime item. That's some great advice. Yeah. And like I said, that's an unfair question because there's so many different variables that factor into that. Um, but you do have some good um, notes on stewardship and how that plays into it. And you outlined three different types of fixes in the ebook. Could you uh, talk about how those three different types of fixes um, apply as you're considering good stewardship uh, in you know, solving an AV problem at your congregation? Well, on stewardship, uh, I always start with the point that uh, as responsible managers of the resources that God has given us through the congregation's donations, uh, it is just as irresponsible to try to buy the absolute cheapest thing we can just because it's the cheapest thing. Uh, it's just that's just as bad a stewardship as it is to go out and buy the, the boutique item that, that costs three times more than you know, your average piece of equipment. Uh, both of those are irresponsible. What we're looking for as good stewards is value. We're looking for uh, an established, reputable brand of equipment that does the job that we need, does exactly the job we need, and hopefully not a whole lot more than what we actually need. Uh, and that gets us into kind of that price range where we're being responsible stewards uh, with those resources. Um, and so the, the kind of the three uh, solutions, uh, I call them ballparks, I think, uh, are kind of a, a Band-Aid solution on the, the cheapest end. And then the middle ground solution, which is where most purchases inevitably end up somewhere in the middle ground and then a full solution. And the important thing to understand is that all three of these solutions as I'm lining them out are all responsible stewardship solutions. So even the Band-Aid solution is still getting at the source of whatever our problem is and attempting to fix it, realizing that we need to go back to the budget committee and look at a one year, two year, three year, whatever it takes plan to go ahead and get into that middle ground or full solution at a later date. Uh, so, um, so in my case with our lighting situation, a Band-Aid solution would be to just simply replace the lighting board because that's the emergency right now. If we don't get that, we don't have a lighting system that works. But when I do that, I don't want to just go buy the cheapest lighting board that I can get that'll work for right now. I want to look at that full solution two, three years down the road uh, and get a lighting board that fits into that full solution. Um, so this is a this is a band aid. I'm not spending all the money on the big full solution. We're just getting exactly what we need. Uh, the middle ground is a full uh, in terms of my exact needs. It it fits those exact needs, but it doesn't have any extras. So um, a middle ground for me right now might be to uh, get the light board and to replace our dimmers uh, possibly with some new LED fixtures, more modern fixtures that have the dimming built into them, but only get enough fixtures to um, light the chancel. Uh, we need eventually to have some dimmable congregational lighting added in, but that's kind of an extra. That's a full solution. Uh, the middle ground would be simply to get the lights that we need to do the job uh, with, with nothing on top of that. Uh, and then, of course, the full solution is not going out and buying the laser lights and the fog machines. <laughs> it's still a responsible stewardship um, solution. It just simply has everything that, that you need uh, and maybe even a few things that would be nice to add that, that are things that you legitimately could use. Uh, so th those are kind of the three ballpark park areas we end up in. I feel like that's kind of the same process I go through every time I take my car into the shop and hear, okay, what are, we, what are our options here? <laughs> Usually we go with the Band-Aid solution, but <laughs> that's not always the wisest choice. All right, well, let's move into the installation phase. Um, that You've made the purchase after going through the sales process. 
Um, it may be tempting to try to install this yourself. Why or why not is that a good idea? What would you recommend uh, as well, a church is considering that? I always install it myself, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's actually not true. Uh, we've had in, we've had installers uh, here at the seminary do a lot of the bigger projects simply because installation is very time consuming, and installation has tons and tons and tons of details that that we never even think of uh, when we're in that sales process. Um, every speaker has to have a mount. It has to have a certain length of cabling. So, and if you forget the those things out of that, then your installation becomes really difficult. So uh, good installers are, are absolutely worth the installation cost. If, if that can fit within your budget, always get that quoted as a separate line item um, so that you know, well, here's what it'll cost to get it installed. You can always work with the vendor too and say, hey, so if I, if I pull all the cable, uh, can you come in and do, you know, the actual mounting the speakers and, and aiming them to get the system set up, right? And so sometimes you can you can save some money on the installation. And um, uh, I didn't actually mention that in the ebook, but it's one good way to save some money on the installation. Uh, what you what you don't want to do is just plan on doing the installation yourself um, if you don't have the expertise to do it, or if you don't have a congregant with the expertise to do it. And uh, again, refer back to our notes on paying your consultant. If you're gonna have a congregant do it, plan on paying them and pay them a fair market rate because that's a lot of time and effort that they're taking away from their job or their family to come uh, do this for the church. If, if they uh, wanna donate that uh, service, um, you know, as, as an act of service to the church, leave that to them, but at least offer to pay them a fair market rate uh, and again, that takes that tension off of them and puts them squarely into that professional realm where they're doing a professional job for the church and not that tension between, uh, you know, being a congregant, and being an installer. So, um, yeah, that that's great advice. And I, and I know, you know, there's things that I try to do by myself that I often regret not uh, paying somebody. I, I, experienced that with a water heater recently where I tried to fix it and made it worse, which <laughs> caused more of an expense for me than if I had just called them up from the beginning. So I think, again, these principles that you're talking about here really can be applied outside, but I think they're especially important as you're looking at AV. Um, now, the last question I have for you revolves around training, and that's something you call out in the ebook that I wouldn't have initially thought of. I, I think about it as we sell software, how important that is. Um, but it's really no different from what you're talking about here with AV equipment. What are your um, views on training and why is it an important investment for the church? Um, well, I think the best way to answer that is to give you a, a recent example of where I messed up in this area. Um, uh, I think it's been two years we updated the lighting in Kramer Chapel. Uh, it was the original lighting from 1960, uh, and we were beginning to have a whole lot of issues with it. So we updated all of the lighting to uh, a modern LED uh, solution, and that's one where we obviously paid an installer to come in and do the whole job. We had electricians in, we had um, a lighting company, that, that's, that's what they do. They're, they're out of Indianapolis, and they did a great job. Um, but we really didn't uh, pay anything extra for training um, and probably a little hubris on my part. Oh, we'll, we'll figure it out. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, they, they gave us kind of a rudimentary, like, here's how to work with the system. But we kind of had a system where it's like, oh, okay, here's the buttons and you push these and the lighting system does this. But I didn't know how to configure it. I didn't know how to deal with any problems that came up. And of course, uh, about a month ago, uh, we had a power outage here on campus that completely zapped the firmware in part of the uh, lighting system. And when the company, I got on tech support, when the company helped us get the firmware reloaded, the whole thing was factory reset. Oh boy. And I was clueless. And it took me three days of tech support calls. And fortunately, we had a fantastic company and this is a great argument for always going with reputable uh, manufacturers and, and good quality sales and ins sales reps and installers who are willing to support their equipment into the future after they're done. Uh, so between the, the company that did the installation and the manufacturer of the lighting equipment, 
I was, after three days, able to learn all the equipment the hard way and get the whole thing reprogrammed. But if we had just spent a little money on a day of training at the onset, I might have been able to avoid three days of downtime with our lighting system in Kramer Chapel. That's a perfect example for why training is so valuable. And even somebody like yourself who's experienced can always learn more. So that's great. Well, John, I appreciate you being on today. We're going to put the link for the ebook up um, in just a moment. Um, so if you would like to download John's ebook and learn more about um, this topic today, you can see it there on the screen. It's um, just a fantastic uh, document that goes through this in great detail, which uh, it's an easy read, and our designer did a great job putting together the uh, the design, so it's even very stylish for you, too. But, John, before we go, any final thoughts or, or words of advice to our viewers who are considering making a big purchase in this AV space? Um, have fun with it. Uh, I think I mentioned this in my, my closing in the ebook, but uh, and I referred to this earlier. Things have come so far in just a short amount of time that uh, uh, and prices have come down and technology has come up. And so the things that churches are able to do, even at their budgets, have just exploded. And so you can have a lot of fun just kind of saying, OK, so here's where we're at. This is where we've been for 20 years with this old sound system. And and what what are we able to do uh, with the new technology that's out? Um, secondly, get involved. Um, my experience a lot of times uh, is when, when I talk to pastors and they're, they, they're like, I don't know anything about our sound system. Um, I really wish somebody else would just deal with this. Um, you know, don't be afraid to get involved uh, and, and take it slow and, and go through the processes that, that I outline in the ebook. Definitely get people in with expertise. Definitely get congregants in that can help you out. But but get involved so that you know what's going on. This is a big process for your church. It's not as big as maybe, you know, a, a building project where we're building a new sanctuary. But it can get pretty big when we're talking full sound systems, lighting systems, that sort of thing. So, so take the time to know what's going on. Get involved with it. Um, you know, and, and take it slow and make sure you know what's going on every step of the way. Know what you're buying, know why they're quoting you the things that they're quoting. And and I promise you'll come out one piece on the other side and you'll, you'll have a great setup. Fantastic. Well, thanks again for both being here today and for writing the ebook. Um, the ebook is available for free at www.concordiatechnology.org slash AV, and it'll take you right to that page. Fill out a short form, and you can access it right then and there. You can download it and, and save it for later, too. So, John, thanks again for being with us today, and thank you to our viewers for watching this. We'll be back next week with another great topic on how to leverage technology in your ministry. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.